All right. Good evening, everybody. How's your stamina? Well, Any thumbs up? There we go. There we go. Way to go. Uh, it's been a it's been a fun day. Um, there's a, looks like there's still a, um, a couple more hours of some fun stuff. So I want to welcome you back to BioC 2021 for the the late 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 show. And um, we have the the usual housekeeping items to go through. Uh, of course, uh, you've you've heard all this before. So if you have questions for the speaker, uh, for events, we'll enter them into the Q and A tab. And uh, the format for today is uh, we'll just take the questions as they come. So don't be shy. And uh, as they come up, then I'll I'll put them on stage um, and and highlight them so Vince can respond. Um, uh, of course, you can upvote questions if you if you feel so inclined. Um, if you want to come on stage and ask it uh, in person as opposed to typing it in, then just use that raised hand feature. Um, don't be shy with your uh, emoticons to give some feedback. Um, and of course, um, the video will be will be available very soon after this is finished. So it's the same format as before. So um, let me introduce to our speaker, Vince Carey from Harvard Medical School. Um, and he's going to be uh, presenting Integrative Genetic Epidemiology with Open GWAS, Open Cravat, and Bioconductor. Vince, take it away. Well, uh, thanks so much, Sean, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's, uh, it's wonderful to, uh, to have uh, you here, and um, I, I want to um, spell things out a little bit through some slides before we get into this idea of demonstration. Uh, and so it's going to be uh, the slides in a Chrome tab that I will share. And I think you can see this now. So this is um, Bioconductor 2021, Integrative Genetic Epidemiology. And um, really, I shouldn't be giving this talk. Uh, on the other hand, I felt that the material that I found uh, was so urgent in its value to people who are doing genetic epidemiology that even though I, I didn't get in touch with the Bristol folks uh, in a timely way, uh, I really had to put something together so that we could start working with this. Um, I don't know how many of you are working with GWAS. In, in the lab here at the Channing Division of, of Network Medicine, uh, there's a big interest in uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and uh, GWAS have been assembled on, on thousands of people, whole genome sequencing, uh, and, and on many lung-related phenotypes. Um, but the management of this data is, is very challenging, and the analysis uh, is even more so. Uh, it's a very fast-moving field. So when I saw this picture that was created by the folks at Bristol, I felt that, uh, you know, a dream has come true, that someone really understands how to put all these things together so that the upstream stuff is well-managed you can get the variants that you want and information about uh, every aspect of their relationship to a phenotype, their genomic context, and so forth. Uh, and then you can go right to uh, the analytical um, processes that are necessary to interpret GWAS hits. Well, um, that's the idea, right? GWAS are very unwieldy, and the open GWAS system uh, looks really good. And the idea that I could have a cons consistent collection of downstream tools was extremely appealing. So that's why I'm going to talk about Open GWAS and this package that I made, which is not a bioconductor package yet. Uh, it's called GWAS Lake, and I'll take you through some of those things. That's topic one. And it's probably enough to do a demo uh, on its own terms, but I wanted also to talk about variant annotation, because the tool, again, that I discovered and that I think has relevance to a great many folks in, in genetic epidemiology, although it's really targeting the genetics of cancer, is this uh, piece out of Rachel Karchin's lab at Johns Hopkins called Open Cravat. And um, it seemed like we should be able to take representations of variants that we build up in Bioconductor 
possibly based on the variants that are in the open GWAS and annotate them using Cravat. And that was the hope of this little workshop. The problem is that, you know, having done the investigation that I did and presented it into our lab where people are very active, I uh, really didn't get a lot of adoption. Uh, and I think that's mostly because people are overwhelmed. Uh, everything is moving very quickly. And one of the topics that people are extremely interested in is co-localization and the algorithms for this and the types of inputs that are needed. Uh, although they're all sort of captured in this schema, it's still not clean enough and not up to the minute enough to keep people's attention. Uh, and so I, I can't say it's been a big, big success to show this to our epidemiologists here and say, oh yeah, that, that is the solution for us. And uh, you know, one of the reasons is that the GWAS summaries, even the summary statistics are inconsistently formatted across all the different studies that have been assembled that might make a contribution to the type of inference you want to do. The annotation of phenotypes is very uh, scattered and LD representation, which is essential, linkage disequilibrium representation to think about where, where you have SNPs and where you have haplotypes and how you can uh, get a handle on what the real genetic variant is that drives a phenotype is just extremely difficult. Lots of people are tackling it, but there isn't a standard and we're not getting there. So it seemed to me that if we could get some mutual agreement that we need tools that assemble in this way, we could start making a plan to hack all this out in a way that lots of people could benefit from it. And I think we're moving in that direction. We've had some contact with the uh, the Bristol folks and um, I, I think things are looking good, but it's still important to, to get time together and to think about what works and what doesn't. So that's the open GWAS story. And then the cravat story is that a lot of the annotation facilities that we need are, are very difficult to wrangle. So for example, Nomad 3 is a 41 gigabyte resource. GTEx, you know, if you want to deal with all the different tissues at a, at a very deep level of EQTL cataloging, it's enormous. And um, GRASP is another nice thing assembled by NHLBI, trying to assemble uh, all of the GWAS uh, results. Haploreg, phenotype ontology, it's really nice to think about the fact that somebody has curated these things so that you can do interrogation through an API rather than having to assemble these things on your local server. And that's what the Open Cravat folks have done. Uh, and so, you know, the hope was that you could get variant collections into some nice format in Bioconductor and just use that to throw them to the API, or you can have the annotators locally and just process them. Um, <clears throat> Now, there's a, the, the workshop proposal that there's a link to in the schedule, I, I don't think is, uh, or is, is not exactly right in the sense that it's not a hands-on um, tutorial here. Uh, but what I'm going to do is take us through uh, how we can work with these things in R, either in GWAS Lake or a package that I have called OC to BIOC for Open Cravat. And, um, and show how this is starting to take form, okay? So I'm gonna stop sharing these slides and start moving into a different set of, of um, text, uh, which is the GWAS Lake um, website, okay? So I'm going to share a Chrome tab, which is now the GWAS Lake Package down site. Exploring the MRC GWAS API and data software ecosystem with Bioconductor. And let's hope that this is large enough that folks can see what I'm scrolling through here. This is the schema. And a lot of these packages here are not in CRAN or in Bioconductor. And therefore, you're getting them from GitHub. And one of the discussions we've had with the Bristol folks is how we can pick out the ones that we really want to make sure are um, regulated in the sense that when R changes, we will know that we have the changes in place so that it doesn't break. Um, that's something that Bioconductor has worked very hard on to have a develop stream and a release stream and be prepared for when packages change in ways that might lead to downstream changes for other other packages. Try to get that all uh, 
up front before R makes its change or bioconductor makes a change so that we know interoperability succeeds. And I think we're going to get there, but it's going to take some work. But that's what this caveat is here. Okay, and I'm not going to be going into the downstream stuff. I'm going to stay upstream because there's enough, enough complication there. Uh, and I want to make sure people are familiar with, with, with what's been developed here. So there's a nice package that was created uh, at the MRC, and it's available in their GitHub repo called IEU GWASR. And um, this GWAS Lake package assembles it with Plotly and Tibble and Ontoproc, which is a bioconductor package that deals with ontology. And I want to just make sure it's clear how all these things can fit together. So IEU GWASR has a very nice function called GWAS Info, and it goes out to their server and it pulls down all of the information on GWAS that they have curated. And I made a snapshot of this in January and it has 34,000 um, entries, which are really 34,000 different traits for which GWAS have been conducted. And so you can get this January snapshot very easily uh, with this little uh, assignment operation, or you can get up to the minute information using GWAS info. It turns out there are about 5,000 additional um, uh, phenotypes that have been studied since the, um, and, and what I mean is not unique phenotypes, but GWAS that have been done on different phenotypes since January. So if you want to get up to the minute, you would use this call. And this is just a quick show of what's there. And the the GWASs are the, assembled into batches, and you can get that through this uh, batches command in, in the uh, G, IEU GWASR package. And you can see that there are 117 records related to um, Biobank Japan. And as we scroll through this table, uh, metabolic biomarkers in UK Biobank, 249. And then we can go to the next page here and see that... Um, there's this pan-ancestry genetic analysis of UK Biobank. So this is a, a very rich collection uh, of phenotypes for which all the top hits are available. And the diseases that are involved have been labeled in different ways. And then the type is, you know, potentially a metabolite or, you know, some kind of immune system marker, or it could be a binary yes or no or an ordered category or a continuous type of response. So these are types of phenotypes. And then the actual categories uh, are here in the, um, through this category uh, uh, disease, which I've gone and tabulated here. All right. And then we can start looking at this disease table uh, here and see that um, the sample size is recorded, the number of SNPs for each of these is recorded in this metadata table. So it's a really rich uh, collection of uh, resources, curated uh, results, summary statistics for many GWAS, for many different phenotypes. And so here is a serve, uh, um, a, an, an overview that you can do with the um, GWAS lake now, it has a function called survey GWAS, and if you give it a couple of phenotypes, it will look through what's available and then make a plot that shows you how many controls there were and how many cases. And so the biggest one here is UK Biobank with uh, 147,000 controls and 314,000 cases. And uh, there's a bunch of traits that have been looked at here. Okay, And you have some that have very large numbers of controls, some with large numbers of uh, with low numbers of controls and low numbers of cases. And some of these have publications. The, P, the PubMed IDs are sometimes available. So there's one for asthma where there's a PubMed ID for this particular uh, GWAS with 107,000 controls and 19,000 cases. So this is helping you to get an overview of just how much data there is out there on a phenotype that you might be interested in. And then... Uh, you can also get a table of top hits for a given phenotype using this survey app function. So all the functions that are available in GWAS Lake are listed here in this reference. Okay, so GWAS Lake is an attempt to think of all these GWAS as a data lake and give you some functions that help you drill down into the data 
to get information there. Now, how about the actual hits? So there's a function called top hits uh, where you have to give it um, the ID of a study. So the ID of a study is uh, associated with a phenotype, a number of cases and controls in the table that comes back from uh, the this place over here, the, um, the GWAS info. So these are the IDs of different GWASs for different um, phenotypes. And you need to know that ID in order to use the top hits function. But once you have it, you can get the top hits and you can go down to any given p-value threshold uh, that you're interested in to get the list of all the SNPs that have been measured for association with the phenotype that this study studied. And annotation on the hits can be obtained using either the RSID, so the variance uh, from a given uh, set of top hits. You can then start to learn about this. So this is only going to tell you the name of the RSID and some information about the genetic analysis. Oops, sorry about that. Maybe that'll go back. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So you're getting the name here of a SNP and you're being told how deep the p-value was and what chromosome it's on and so forth. But if you want to learn a little bit more about the um, this variant, then you get variants by RSID, and this will tell you what gene it's linked to um, and other information uh, about that particular variant. That's part of IUGWASR. And then the idea of a FIWAS is where you get a SNP and then you ask, well, what are the phenotypes that demonstrate an association with that. And that's, again, IUGWASR has this FIWAS function, which can generate a table. And then if you have a SNP of interest, you can learn about the traits that have been found for that um, SNP. Sorry about the, the layout here. That's just uh, the way package down works. So that's a FIWAS. And um, we can see that there are EQTLs among these uh, FIWAS results. So EQTLs are, are genes whose expression has been shown to vary as a function of the genotype of the SNP that you're looking at. And then we can ask, well, what chromosomes uh, do those EQTLs live on? And then you find that this SNP may be associated with the expression of genes all over the genome. So that's an interesting type of thing to observe. That would be called a trans EQTL if it was correct. And um, this allows you to start thinking about that uh, relatively conveniently. Okay. Now, one of the problems that I noted before is that people annotate the traits um, with arbitrary terminology. So you might have lung function, you might have FEV1, uh, FEV1 over FVC, FEV1, FVC ratio, all kinds of terms get used. And um, the word, uh, the, 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 the discipline of ontology is an attempt to systematize vocabularies that are used to uh, annotate, well, any sort of thing. That's what ontology is about. Ontology is a field of philosophy about the, the nature of existence, what things exist. Well, if something exists, let's give it a unique name. If it's, a, if it's an individualized thing. And that's what disease ontology is all about. Give formal terms to um, uh, diseases. And then you learn that there's a hierarchy uh, of terminologies. And here, for example, is a set of terms that are more precise than just a blood system disease. It's actually, a, let's say, anemia. And then there may be subtypes of anemia. Let's give them very carefully chosen terms and give them systematic uh, tags uh, which are typically numeric in form, uh, that help us find these very precise terms for precisely defined phenotypes. And so there has been a little bit of work uh, on mapping the traits that were used in the uh, MRC GWAS ecosystem to these disease ontology terms. And this is how it's done. It's really just a matching process. Uh, it's very informal, but it helps us to uh, get a handle on, um, you know, relationships among phenotypes 
uh, that may be of interest to look at together. Um, so you have, you know, some blood coagulation disease. Uh, maybe there are subtypes of this that we'd want to group together uh, if the terminologies for the phenotypes have been used in, 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 in a systematic way. And that is work that uh, actually has, has been done very incompletely, but we're hoping to do this in a more systematic way. All right, so um, we were able to map a, a relatively small number of traits, but once we do that, we have a lot more computational capability to link things together. One study is using ICD, ICD-10 codes. So that's something we could also take advantage of, but this code will not do that. We'd have to introduce some more relationships between disease ontology and ICD in order to uh, benefit from that. Now, one of the things that um, is very helpful for people who are doing genetic epidemiology is a so-called Manhattan plot. And it's um, a function in, I think, uh, the, the um, GWAS Lake, no, it must be an IUG. Oh, yes, GWAS Lake defines the Manhattan plot function for which the documentation is here. And there's a little example in GWAS Lake that you can run to get one of these um, uh, Manhattan plots. To see what the structure of variation is, do we really just have one very narrow uh, region of the genome that is involved uh, with the phenotype or is it is more spread out? So it's easy to make Manhattan plots uh, using this system. So that's the uh, review of the GWAS Lake package that gets us through working with a whole bunch of GWAS that have been curated by the um, <clears throat> MRC folks at U Bristol. Okay, so I'll uh, stop for a minute to see if there are any questions. Doesn't look like it. And uh, I think we will then change gears and move over towards uh, the cravat illustrations. So I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. And I think in this next bit, we're going to be looking a little bit at our studio. So I'm going to share my entire screen. And it may look a little different to you. Let's see when it, it rolls up. There we are. Okay. So here we go. Um, this is a view of uh, R that is going to be carried out in um, a system called Anvil, which is the NHGRI um, Analysis and Visualization Laboratory for Genomic Data. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to use our studio. Uh, you can find this um, in the Anvil ecosystem if you ever go over there. It's called uh, anvilproject.org. And you go to workspaces and you could search for um, cravat, let's say, and there it is. So this is a workspace called um, variant annotation with uh, open cravat. And um, there is also this, um, how can I put it? Uh, a package down site, I'm pretty sure, hub.com. Uh, no, 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 vjcitn at github.io or bioc open cravat. That's right. Let me make sure that I'm not skipping over that. Um, the package down site for this uh, also deals with um, a container so that you can do everything that's described in these documents. And um, single variant queries, right? So if there's a SNP that you're interested in uh, and you want to um, learn about it, there are ways to, to do this. Um, and I just want to make sure, yeah, I thought it was very interesting um, to use this uh, BioC open cravat package and uh, generate some variants. I'll talk to you about those in a little more detail. But a package that I didn't know too much about is called TNT, which is for interactive visualization of, um, you know, genomic features in a very interactive way. So, for example, I'm drilling down here uh, on uh, the region from 64.55 uh, megabases to 64.65 megabases in chromosome 11. 
And I can see that these variants uh, may be in, in coding regions for, for given genes. And, um, you know, you're able to um, expand and contract uh, this display to get a, a, a bigger picture of the context of clusters of variants, let's say. I thought that was interesting. And there's, there's a functions called TNT demo in, in BioC Open Cravat to help folks uh, get a handle on that. Um, so I, I just wanted to make sure that was in, in, in view because uh, I didn't know about that. And it can be quite useful to have these interactive displays connected with R. So the, uh, the variant annotation operations that we can do with, um, with this uh, BioC open cravat, um, I'll, I'll take you through them uh, so that it's clear what's happening here. Um, I have some packages uh, installed. Let's see what our session info looks like. I hope this is big enough to see. We're going to be using Shiny and OC to BioC. That's in my GitHub repo. And Plotly and annotation resources and curated TCGA data uh, because we have nice representations of uh, cancer mutations there. And that's what I'd like to use in order to, um, to go through this. And so the piece of code that we're going to start off with is um, to use curated TCGA data to get the um, mutation data on adrenocortical carcinoma, uh, adrenocortical carcinoma. Uh, and the code that we use to do that is here. Uh, I'll just paste it in. Yeah. You use the curated TCGA data. You ask for this, G this tumor type, ACC. You'll ask for the mutations. It's not a dry run. And uh, we're not going to be very verbose. And we're going to use a version 1.1.38 of the uh, underlying uh, TCGA data. And so we're going out. Uh, and in this case, um, it will pull information from Bioconductor or from your cache, if you've ever done this calculation before, in order to generate this entity called ACC. And we see that this is a multi-assay experiment. It need not only be uh, the data on mutations. I could have also pulled down data on gene expression or mRNA and microRNAs and so forth. But we're just interested in the mutations right here. And in fact, we're going to drill down on this thing. We're going to take out just the experiment uh, that is called the mutations. And we will run the R code to do that right here call the experiments function. And what we get back is a ragged experiment. Why is it a ragged experiment? Well, it's not a, like a summarized experiment because each individual presents a different set of mutations. Whereas in a summarized experiment, each individual is going to present the same set of genes on which expression has been measured or whatnot. A ragged experiment accommodates the case of mutation data where actually um, different people have different numbers of mutations. And um, I'm going to quickly convert this um, mutation information into a G ranges because uh, that will enable us to look at it um, in a very familiar way. So let's do that. Just a couple of lines of code to produce that. And all of this is in that workspace. So here we are. We've now got a G ranges, which is going to tell me the location of uh, the mutations that were observed uh, in ACC, in the TCGA. <clears throat> and the total number of um, mutations that we're looking at is 20,000. So um, it turns out that there are um, mutations that are actually, um, what's the term? They are uh, insertions or deletions, let's say. They're more than just substitutions. And um, at this time, Open Cravat is not going to deal with those. So we're going to focus attention on the single nucleotide substitutions. And that's going to lead us to uh, a smaller set of variants. Uh, this one is, um, oh, is all that metadata that we have to scroll through here. But um, right now, we have 18,787. And in fact, when the analysis is done, that's going to go down into the 15,000 number because we only really work with the unique 
um, variants to deal with open cravat. So there's another couple of pieces of code here. These are um, build 37, but open cravat likes to work with uh, build 38. So we're actually going to lift over here to get our variants into um, HG38 coordinates, and we've got 15,000 unique ones. <clears throat> okay, so I've got a G ranges, and um, there's a function in OC to BIOC that will convert our G ranges into a usable input for open cravat. And here it is, it's called make OC postable. <clears throat> and that's because if you wanted to just use open cravat, you could take this and throw it into their run.opencravat.org app. And it would do it for you. And I guess I can show you what that looks like here. Um, so you can use open cravat by going to run.opencravat.org. You can pick uh, a file that you want to use and uh, tell them to annotate it. And you can pick out annotators from this huge collection that they have. I've done things a little differently. It's more self-contained here, uh, but the number of annotators that I've brought into the space is uh, relatively limited. <clears throat> so this is what our little table looks like. This is all Open Cravat really wants. And we can now uh, write this table out to a, to a disk file that Cravat, the Python module, uh, that's part of this installation, will uh, operate on. So we're going to take this um, postable text file, whoops, and uh, I'm going to grab the code here and paste it in here uh, and just write this table out to a file. Um, whoops, didn't do it. That's that. That's the wrong one. Um, hmm, MTB. Let me see. Well. Once we've got this, we can see whether we have a TSV file here to use. Yes, ACC demo TSV is what I uh, wanted to work from. It's basically a matter of, I think I, I ruined the code, actually. Let's see if I can just redo that. There we go. So this is the code I want to use to write this out to a place that I'm interested in uh, working with. So I want this MTB table to be written out to a, a fixed file acdemo.tsv, and then I can run an app. So res equals OC app, and now a Shiny app will begin. And this Shiny app will look around for TSV files where it's been invoked, and you'll see acdemo.tsv, and now I will click on it to say, I would like to see Cravat do the um, annotation of the variants in this file. And you should be able to see this app running, and in our studio, you can see as it's running through the different annotators that are available, um, it is uh, making progress. And now I want to see what the results are looking like on the app, and I don't see it. It looks like the app died. So it should be something. We'll run it again. And um, yes, I'll run it a slightly different way. Because what it did, what Cravat did, was it created a SQLite database. And if I just click on that, I'll get very quick results of the um, analysis that has been done. So what Open Cravat did was it went and figured out what the different genomic contexts are for all of the variants that we looked at. So on different chromosomes, there are different collections of downstream variants or um, missense var mis variants and so on. And it also computes the gene ontology um, uh, categorization of all of the genes for which the, the variants are annotated. So that's very nice. And then you can look at the individual variants here and learn about what transcripts they're annotated to, or you can get richer information about the genes um, that are uh, involved here uh, by looking at the gene tab. And you can sort uh, or search for a biological process if you're interested in uh, one or another, and so forth. So um, that's how the app works. Um, so what I've shown you is how to take uh, variant information 
in, that comes from TCGA and turn it into input for Open Cravat and then use an app in, um, in the OC to BIOC package in order to get information about these variants. And uh, this OC to BIOC package also includes uh, tools for, uh, if we take a look at the reference here, ah, well, looks like it, it doesn't. It's OC to BIOC, not BIOC open cravat, that um, has uh, more um, capabilities. Let's take a look at the, um, the OC to BIOC um, repertory of functions. So I'll kill the app there and do a search. And then we'll do an ls of three. And so we can see these are all the functions that have been put together for bioconductor users in the OC to BIOC package. And this is what allows you to install new annotators and um, get more results when you run the app for the variants that you have put together. So I think that's bringing us pretty close to the end of this demo session. And um, I think I will stop sharing and uh, just um, open up for questions or comments. It's a dense uh, presentation. Fortunately, it's been recorded. If you have the stomach for it, you can take a look at the recording and find uh, things that I said that may be useful to you. Or you can send me an email or enter an issue on any of the GitHub repos that I've mentioned here, and uh, we can collaborate on, on this uh, technique for finding and annotating variants and dealing with the uh, GWAS ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. And uh, while you're talking, I tried to go and look up the various GitHub repos that you that you were going through, and I, I posted them in the chat, and I hope I got them right, or at least close enough that you can sniff around. Um, Super. Thank so you. Look through there. To, to, um, do those re do those um, repos? Do they have any any workbooks or, or notebooks um, that that step through some of the examples that that you are just walking us all through there? Well, uh, yeah. Um, the the GWAS Lake, for example, is a um, is a package down site. So all of the text that we have there is built out of our markdown files that are part of the package. So um, depending on how you want to work with it, you can start our studio, grab one of those R markdowns and, and walk through chunk by chunk uh, to carry out the calculations. Okay. Cool, so that'd be, that'd be good for anyone that wants to go through and try to try to walk through this, then there should be And some. then file issues, yes. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the audience? I think their brains are waterlogged. I don't blame you. Um, Happy to uh, take emails or, or um, issues on, on the on the repos to try to make this work better. So so Vince, I have I have a kind of a broader uh, broader question. Uh, at my institution, a lot of people have steered away from doing GWAS because they're so expensive. Um, they just cost a lot of money. Um, looking at the tools that that you know, just kind of looking at what you're showing here. And given how much info is available, you also have to wonder, um, is it even worth doing an, your own GWAS when you can piggyback of, piggyback off of so much other stuff that's out there? Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, I, I mean, that's exactly where I want to be to make sure that we can capitalize on what's already there. And that turns out to be fairly difficult. Uh, you know, you have a GWAS um, portal related to the UK Biobank that's uh, curated at the Broad Institute. And, uh, you know, I hope that the curation is, is, is going better. But uh, even there, in one place for a, a family of GWAS, is, it's extremely difficult. You wind up downloading tons of things and then, you know, sometimes having to build your own tools just to get information on a variant that you're interested in. And it seems to me that there's been so much work uh, done in a piecemeal way in many different places, all with good intentions, that is very difficult to synthesize. And I thought the Open GWAS guys have really taken uh, a great step in the direction of trying to help people synthesize. 
Um, whether you can get away with not doing a GWAS for something that you're really interested in, uh, I, I, I'm not the person to comment on that. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of reuse, though, in the context of new molecular information about mechanism that, again, you want to go back to the GWAS and say, well, now, do I know more about the context of this particular variant that will help me interpret it? And that's where I, I, I would really like to see us uh, build momentum. And again, this is the kind of work, uh, teamwork that's needed in order to allow that. And I, and I feel like there's um, there's kind of a steep um, there's a there's a high activation energy for getting for, for kind of getting into all of this because once you start rummaging around in these different gateways and repositories and you know we talk about how there's all this data out there but trying to trying to navigate through the the portals that are there and understand how is it that I even like get it and on accessible and then once i've downloaded it then it's it's often you know put in these um in these objects in such a way that if you if you knew all the accessors then it could be pretty straightforward but trying to trying to get really well documented examples about how to step through use the accessors understand what they're all getting out after i mean that it's we that's a big challenge at our institution is there's so many people who want to get in and then they just, they, they spend a day poking at it and then give up because yeah, it's, I, it's hard. I, I think you're absolutely right. And um, that's one of the reasons that I introduced the Anvil, the NHGRI Anvil, where there is a workspace that um, you should be able to get access to and even use freely. Uh, it's all based on open data. The point of Anvil is really to allow people to do intensive investigation of closed data because they have dbGaP authorization. But um, we've been trying to make it accessible uh, on open data. And I, I think the idea that uh, we don't have to download, but the data are already curated in a cloud accessible format, uh, but we can spend our time thinking about, as you say, the accessors, the filters, uh, the you know downstream inference things, put them in one place, make it clear uh, as to what the winning um, workflows are, and then have people go and, and use those for the facets of the of the topic that they want to get into. Um, it's not proving to be a slam dunk to get people on and to get them to e even try it out. So there's a lot of um, I don't know motivational. Uh, thinking and 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 um, teaching to be done, uh, and I, you know, I think we need to talk together, um, uh, if possible, to see whether in in your place there are ways to move this forward. Well, and that's an invitation to anybody who's on the call. Um, yeah. We have to we have to talk and we have to try to do things in a coordinated way. There's a lot of brains working on the problem, so. Yeah. We should have to be able to figure it out. Well, uh, if there's no other questions, then then maybe we'll take 15 minutes before the before the next session and get up and go get some coffee and um and get get ready for another one. But thank you very much, Vince. Really, really nice. appreciate your time and 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 for a great presentation. Look well, thank you so much. And uh, have a good evening or afternoon, whatever. Thanks. Bye now. Bye bye.